Well, hi, Tommy. So are you doing again? Howdy, oh, Neil. Good to talk. I haven't talked in a while. And it's, uh, I'm very excited about our upcoming plans. That's how I feel. Yeah, so do I. Right, really, yeah, really, really very much so. Uh, because we've got, um, it's our three with Atlantis and Empire Lost and Found. And first of all, we have the book. This is the only one on the planet at the moment, the proof book. And it's looking really, really good. And so, and you're pretty much film, finished with the film, I think, aren't you? The film, in terms of production, post audio, it's going, it's still, the audio won't be done for another month or so, but the film is 99% done. There'll just be a little bit more that you and I will do when, mm -hmm. when you come to Ireland next week. Uh, just a few more to tidy up things. But yeah, it's in terms of the actual production of the rushes are 95%, 97% done. Really? And yeah, so everything is running on a smooth and on a schedule. Well, I look, I saw the first half an hour of it and it is superb. I mean, I was really proud of it. You, the, you've done an amazing job. And that's before I put the cinematic processing in so the final one will look even better. It'll look like a movie. It's really, really good, isn't it? Yeah. So what we're gonna... Sorry, go on. I said I'm delighted with it. So yeah. Uh, so we're going we're gonna, to um, premiere the film at the Mysterious Earth Conference which is over in Preston. Um, and that's on the Saturday the 10th and Sunday the 11th of September, the Mysterious Earth Conference. And we're gonna start, I've just got a brand new two and a half meter screen, which is, which is underneath my feet at the moment, because it's so big, you know, to get it in my, room, my living room. Uh, so that is gonna look fantastic. So we're gonna start the conference with the film and, and that's that uh, we like a cinema because that hall is, that doesn't have many windows. It's nice and dark when the lights are off. It will be. It'll be a. Uh, it'll be dark. A brilliant projector. It's going to look fantastic because it's because it's not just me and you talking. It, it, it's uh, the the the, the animations. We're putting on a show. Yeah, it's going. I really think it's going to be fantastic. So that's going to be the first thing, and then uh, I've put us down for uh, a discussion after that so that'll be the first that'll take us up to lunch so it'll be the film and then me and you'll just answer questions or discuss the film with the with the audience so please do book your tickets early because they are going there are a lot of people have booked already and you can book it from um from the web page at megalithictours.com the button on the bottom of the conference page there so uh that that's so how did, how did it all start Let's, let's think about this. Why, why did we do this? About two years ago, you contacted me. You'd come across my work somehow and you would look, you said, you said uh, that you'd, you'd like to just work together. And you casually mentioned when we were somewhere in, I think in England or Ireland, when we first met up, you had said, I, I'm really, I'd love to make a film about Atlantis. And it's, it's funny you said that because that's been in the back of my mind ever since I wrote the book, The Druid Code. Mm -hmm. And then that's how it started. It was, wasn't it? And remember that like, we went to the Lake District and we started talking about our feelings about the sites and how they happened, where they came from and uh, why they're there. And we, we agreed on so much and we kind yeah. of independently thought the same things. Um, so that, that, so that sort of added to eventually, and then the thing about the processional ways, which is my little little baby and and eventually just say we, we kind of had the contents of a book there and waiting didn't we yeah i i was at first i i was you know i know the processional ways and are all a big deal in the megalithic world but when you first mentioned that, that could be tied to some atlantean consciousness i i i i started to really get thinking deep into that then and it started to make a lot of sense to me because those processional ways don't really exist in any other form of megalith or anything else. They're not, you don't see them anywhere except on these islands, really, and maybe in Karnak, but you don't see them really anywhere else. And they're always on the margins, on the fringes. And they're such an integral part of the megalith, the met, as, as, as are the enclosures. You see, you're right. You know, when you said to me that time, there's, 
the megaliths in Britain and Ireland, although they're part of the European megalithic arc, they're a whole other thing all by themselves. Yeah. And that's yeah. what really started me going, because then I said, well, that's a whole other culture. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I remember <clears throat> so many years just going, I mean, I've been done really constantly traveling around ancient sites for 20 years now. And you start building up an idea. And so in, in Europe, okay, that's a whole, you got all the, the, they've all got their own types of megaliths and different formations and towers and um, towers and all this sort of thing. But it's only here that they have, that I, I saw that they have these processional ways. And it's as if, I thought, well, this has to be like the centre of pilgrimage. Otherwise, why would you have them? And then it all sort of clicks together. If it's a pilgrimage, why, what makes it an attraction? What makes it so, like the, like the islands a spiritual destination in themselves? And the complexity of them, the further you go west and north, the complexity of the, the Ness of Brogner, um, the mm. sheer infrastructure that's there. And what's there left there, there, left there now is a lot less than what used to be there. The footprint of many other megaliths are still under the ground, shown up by the GFIs. Sligo in the, here, on the very fringes of Ireland, they're still finding megaliths in the town to this day. And they're just, why is the complexity of the megalithic culture so complex on the, on the sea? Just like in Cumbria, on the sea, near the sea, not far from it. And it's because it was a, mar a maritime megalithic culture, mm -hmm. or the traces or footprints of one. Absolutely, and um, and that goes down because we, when you first look at it, you think, "Well, that's great," but they do have them in in Karnak, which is in a. But then when you look at the timings, and the, I mean, Karnak was part of these islands then. So at, at the times we're talking, which I do believe are earlier than. Uh, kind of usually uh, orthodox archaeology would say it is. So, so you've got processional ways and pilgrimage ways right, right down through through Brittany. I mean, what, what else can those lines be, those huge lines of megaliths, if they're not for walking down? <laughs> and, and we discovered so many smoking guns that added to the story. And that, like, that was one of them. But there was others too, like the the mythology of the two of the Dan and, and then yeah. that you know, the European mysteries, which is a big part of the second part of the film, mm. which is your basically your your mostly your gig. But we were able to glue the very ancient past into the European mystery tradition. That was a smoking gun that came out very powerfully. Things like the the technology, this the stone spheres in Scotland and the Nout the, the Nout mace head in Ireland. These things that even here we, we, we found quotes by Irish academics saying that this thing, this five and a half thousand year old thing could only have been created with, with a high pressure Dremel type tool. It could not have been done by hand. And the, as, as a previous high technology culture brought these things to these islands or was part of it. So we've been, we've been saying for so long, uh, and I've been saying to people so long, there used to be a pre-advanced civilization that had um, that had their own uh, physics, which we have totally forgotten, the, and their way of engineering. And this kind of it, it, it kind of answers all these questions. It's funny, isn't it? As you start with a, a thesis or an idea, and you start looking into it, your mind brings uh, attracts different part, different parts of it, and it the begins to call to, to create yeah. a whole. A cohesion comes in. Yeah. Like I was actually very surprised. I thought we'd struggle. I know, and, you know, just like yourself, me and my background knew somehow that the megaliths on these islands were connected to uh, this Atlanta story. Whatever this Atlanta story was, there was a connection there. The, it the, seemed the, that way. A folklore alone put that. A big one for me was when you took me to see the Dakar Bears. Now, that yeah. was. I was like, okay, that these things are from a different country, and, and I've got quite a good art, a knowledge in art and art history. And I was like, uh, this is not from here. This is so, this is from yeah. a different consciousness that's not not apparent anywhere else in in megalithic Europe. You know, I, I love taking people to the Dakar Bears because the okay, I love that. Then you start looking at it, and they always think, and then they, well, wait a minute, what about that? Well, what's this? I never seen anything like that before. You go around the four of them, and 
the, the people are absolutely mind blown by them. Yep. Because they're just something totally different, aren't they? They could have been made on a different planet. They could have been, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was another thing too that I, 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 I want and I hope we will not debunk, but change people's consciousness in the film. Because the story of Atlantis took place in, was told to us from Plato's classical Greek time, people have a tendency to overlay an ancient Greek aesthetic upon Atlantis that would look like Athens, ancient Athens, or it looked like, you know, ancient Sparta or Adelphi. It really didn't because that's only a kind of a, a prejudice put into our heads by popular culture. In reality, it was much older than Andium and it would have had its own style, its own aesthetic. And that's what we see in the, the, these buildings we see around the world from these periods. Yeah, th yeah, that's exactly it. You say, why did they do it? How did they do it? It kind of explains it, doesn't it? Because yeah. to them, that was probably what they did, you know? Yeah. And it's, uh, uh, sorry, carry on. And the residual cultural legacy is left over. Like, for instance, the Round Towers of Ireland. There's nothing like them anywhere else in the world. No. And why is there a hundred of them just in Ireland? And when they were built, they would have been the skyscrapers of the, of the, of the time. There would, have, would have been a building on earth that had been as tall as they were. And you're like, why? What, what's, what the hell? You know, that kind of thing. And it's like, that had to have come from somewhere else. Yeah, and it's good in a way that so the, the things that I found really interesting over the years and the things that you have, like the round towers, has really been a big thing for you. We've managed to meld the whole thing together to great, great sort of that that say that whole. And we've actually also managed to, managed to look back so far into the past, go through the the time of Atlantis, go bring it more up to date with our megaliths, and we've managed to match that up through the Western missions to what's happening today. And it's amazing how it just creates, you know, an absolute timeline. Yeah, well, that was very exciting for me when I was reading how you had tied the, because I got the Western mystery tradition into it because I had often, I've often, what is ground one? What is ground one of, this is ground zero of the Western mystery traditions? Is it Egypt? You know, we tend to sell ourselves short because we always told us in the Middle East, it's Egypt. It came to us from the East. Well, I mean, I always suspected that, that was completely wrong because the development of megaliths is from the yeah. West to the east so it's the uh, opposite yeah. of what we've been told and that put that tied it all in together for me perfectly especially when later on reading about the roots of freemasonry by thomas Paine and stuff like that where he said it came from ancient europe and suddenly it changed the narrative but yeah. it's not all egyptian it's not all no. semitic it's not all babylonian there's a big story on this side that has been i believe deliberately Played down so it's in the hands of certain initiates. Yeah, and it's a way of saying it's a bit like saying, "Oh, we don't know how it must be aliens." Yeah. It's like, "Well, don't, how did we get this? Oh, it's from Egypt." It's yeah. kind of, and that's not really an answer, is it? You know, it's, yeah. and, and if you because the, the very fact that we're in this part of the world, we've been trying to different organizing, we're trying to pull the different bits together and find the different pieces of the jigsaw and they're trying to rebuild this whole thing and he says it's doing that you know it's not happening in egypt at all really yeah and and and, and solon was, was completely you know it's distinct he said this was before egypt this was very old mm. civilization that inspired these ones and uh, there were bits of it came to it. And there may be even bigger parts. This story is so gigantic. There's a whole, you know, you can bring Africa into it, eventually to the Dogon and stuff like that. The American, we only scratched the surface on these kinds of yeah. other peripheral things like the American stuff. But uh, the, this, uh, you know, I have no doubt now, you know, for a long time, I used to believe, I, I couldn't decide whether Atlantis was a real thing or, or, or an allegory. But now I firmly believe that there was absolutely 100% a continent, an empire, a maritime power for civilization prior to what we think is Western civilization that existed in the Central Atlantic, just precisely where Plato was very specific about its location. Yeah, and that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, people look for 
um, they look for Atlantis all over the world. But Plato actually said where it was, and he said where it wasn't. So I don't know why people shoot off all around the world trying to find it. I mean, it was in the Atlantic. <laughs> Atlantis was in the Atlantic. And, and, and even Ignatius Donnelly, 150 years ago, figured said it had to be in the Atlantic because it's the only thing that explains the megalithic culture of Europe and directly across the megalithic culture of Central America. You know, they don't appear, the, the megalithic culture of, of Western Europe, of, of North America, doesn't appear in Canada. It appears exactly where Atlantis would have ended on the other side. Yeah, and in Timaeus and um, Critias, Critias he, he actually said that it wasn't in the Mediterranean, it was beyond the Pillars of Hercules, or Heracles, as you call it. So he said it wasn't in the Mediterranean. I mean, how's that? Does that mean he was in the Mediterranean? <laughs> no, it's, it doesn't make any sense, does it? So. And it even said that the the the, the, the entrance was a, was a port leading into you know that was the entrance to the great continent. They were very specific, and you hear people are telling us it's a it's a it's a volcano in Africa and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. They were extremely specific, and where it was located in the Atlantic, it would have touched on all these megalithic cultures around Western Europe, the megalithic arc, and also on on the, like things like the Bimini Road in the Bahamas and so on. It's mm. not that difficult to find Atlantis. It's no. it's peripheral as its peripherals are perfectly marked. It's weird. It's weird, isn't it? How people go off on a tangent for, and then he um he said this. They say it was an it was just a story an analogy, but he actually says this is not a story. This is the truth. Don't think it's a story. Yep. And then you add all this, this, the so-called mythology. We know, like we've been told from everybody, from Cam, Joseph Campbell to J.R. Tolkien, mm. that mythology is real. It's just a different way of telling a story. But, you know, Irish mythology is full of the two of the Dan and these people, the, the High Brazil, and uh, we, uh, you know, the, got turned and Og, you have the Tolkien talking about these island, these people, these kingly races that, came to North Britain that are part of the folklore and they came across the sea with new method, methods of agriculture. It's, it's just too much of this stuff to say, you know, if there was just the Atlanta story, you'd say, okay, maybe that. But it's corroborated by endless folklore in Northern yeah, Europe. Yeah, yeah. And the, the mysteries as well, I was, um, there's a lot of the, the, the grail myths are like a fundamental part of the early mystery stories. They were, and then when you came up with the four treasures, yeah. I mean, um, that just, oh, wow, a connection. Uh, we were looking to say, is there a connection? And when you came up with those, I thought, oh, that was it. Yeah. And I was like, light, light, all they took, you know. Four treasures brought from beyond the seas that became the four treasures of Ireland, that became the four grail mystery treasures of Jeffrey and, of Martin. And even That's look like the four, um, uh, the four suits in... Uh, in the in the tarot, yeah, and, and other things too. Like, um, it uh, it it just stated from the the Grail. The Grail mysteries are really, I think, the genesis of the modern Western mystery tradition, mm -hmm. because it all seems to have come out of that whole the, the Grail mysteries, and that was like the base because they were so popular in in uh, in not just Britain but also in France and places like oh, that. Yeah. So. That was kind of ground zero, but when you trace that back, here's Geoffrey of Bormit uh, writing about the ancient treasures of Ireland. And he also dropped another few truth bombs along the way. He spoke about how Stonehenge was actually in Ireland and floated across by Maryland. Now, that's definitely an allegory, but he's showing that, that at the ancient stones the connection. from the West, it's always going to the West, you know. Didn't he say that when he brought the the four the four treasures were brought over, didn't he say that they came from a sunken land, a land that was yeah, or a flooded land? It's like I mean, it's there, isn't it? And they came on a storm, yeah, yeah, and, you know, so and, yeah. And they came just like the North British stories with new methods of agriculture and this kind of thing, and uh, new they were seen as a kind of a, a almost supernatural beings because they had high technology. That the natives that they do that they introduce the natives to. Yeah, and he talks about all ties up. And then when you when you're looking across to the Grail myths, 
a lot of them came out of the court of champagne where also the um the knights templars did so then you've got this idea of the the high society or a, a people that believe themselves to be uh of a kingly race yeah so where did this kingly race come from you know well if you even look at the kind of heritage of the british kings the english kings well the britannic kings and the welsh kings and then you have tara in ireland it's a very different kind of royalty than the royalty of say europe of the like the, of, of like lorraine and those other places it's they almost have like this supernaturalism about them when you re, when you read about king penda when you read about you know the 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 grail this the the Arthurian legends when the the, the the real stories of Tara, they're not even they're not even legends they're actual facts they're so and then the history of the welsh kings there's something they they're almost spoken about as a different beings that arrived among us do you ever get that i've, I've yeah, always got that impression yeah i'll tell you on a so more spiritual i was when you go to tara which i did last week the, just you can feel it you know you just the whole thing just has a different feel to it's a different feel to the megaliths but it's a very spiritual place and the memories of what's happened there sort of reeks of it and we're going to get there next week in two weeks aren't we? but yeah it, it, you can feel you can feel that it's different that's the classic atlantean land landscape you have the the, the hinges the, the circle with the, with the road into the middle of it just like this is another thing we, we, we brought to this documentary was the concept of the circular enclosure we were told by plato was there's a, a concentric circles with a, a road through the middle of made from canals that symbol is everywhere in megalithic even on log meg in yeah. you know everywhere on megaliths all over europe and all over uh, esoteric and occultic buildings it's you don't have to look even no. far to find it. it'll be 20 miles from where you live no matter where you are in these islands you will find yeah, an ancient stone to, with that shape i'm just trying to find one now because uh, I, we've got a picture in the book of, of one of them and it, it's um there's the famous one in Roscommon. You swear it was Atlantis. All that's missing is the water. There's loads of these multi-wing enclosures. Oh, I can't find it. But it's, uh, yeah, I mean, when we looked at it, we just sort of said, well, that picture, it's like a diagram of Atlantis. It, called it's into a, the rock. So like, their sigil, it, like their sigil or their trademark. And then that appears on the landscape in concentric circles of megaliths. I mean, there it is. All, well, all that's missing is... All that's missing is the water. And then you have huge concentric ringed enclosures in the west of Ireland, like in uh, Roscommon, in Castle Ray, not far from here. And that thing is, all that's missing is the water. You have Atlantis. Yeah. You have it. Yeah. It's like the cup and ring marks, isn't it? It's like, yeah. everybody says, well, what are they? Nobody ever, nobody ever knows. But, yeah. you know. It's, it's almost like their trademark or their... Uh, their insignia yeah as if it was yeah as if say this is uh, or a flag even it's like this represents our homeland and and how it was organized yep yeah so everything everything we've kind of done we all had these ideas floating around our, in our head and it's great to be able to um, put it all into one place and and to have a sequence of how we, yeah. we think it, it's all worked out so, and, and that's the thing i think you and i with this project are really planting a seed that we yeah. hope other people will take and run with it because yeah. there's a huge amount still to be uncovered in this story we've only just opened pandora's box a little bit yeah we were not saying that this is the answer we're not saying anything we're just throwing it forward to to you guys really to say well this is what we think you know we've been doing it quite a lot of years and this is what we've come up with and hopefully it'll help the whole process of events to take it because and we've done what what you usually do Thomas is got we've we've gone look we've gone off to left field yeah, and yeah. we haven't really stopped listening to the, what anybody tells us let's decide for ourselves what we think and it's yeah. taken us down a, down a, an avenue so yeah, blank, blank canvas is a beautiful way to control uh, to control your own prejudice and the overall narratives of ancient sites because at the end of the day, the experts don't know any more than us no. amateurs. Do the heck? No. They don't. They just have yeah. their own story. They haven't agreed upon consensus. Mm -hmm. 
But the and reality they teach is, it to the next person and the next person and the exactly. next person. If you were to, if aliens were to land from another planet and look at our megaliths, they would develop their own story about them. They're blank canvases. They are. So that's, so that's our, once again, that's our book. It will be available at the conference. We're going to launch it then, about the book launch, and we'll show the film. Uh, and then you're going to do another talk as well, aren't you, about um, the, the sites of Sligo and tying the folklore and... Uh, and archaeology, how the two yep. fit in. I'll be doing all that, yeah. There's a, let's have a quick flash through the other people. Uh, Peter Harris, he's, he's um, gone out and done the measuring thing again. Uh, a bit like Alexandra Tom measured all the, the sites, and he's found a unit of measurement that he wants to present to us. And, you know, this will be interesting, you know, because uh, there's been a lot of work that's gone into that. John Trippier, a good friend of mine, he's he's an archaeologist in Preston, um, in Lancashire. He works mainly for Lancashire County Council. Like, I like I like archaeologists because they dig everything up for us. They clean it off with tooth with toothbrushes, and then we then we can go and have a look at them and explain to them what they are. <laughs> anyway, John, he's talking heaven or Valhalla, Viking sculptured crosses and stones of the northwest. So he's an expert on sculpture crosses and we all love those don't we peter uh Yanaski, who you know don't you the artist uh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah Kowski, yes recently just became a great grandfather i believe <laughs> really yeah oh, good on him yeah that's one of his he's, a, he's an artist that's one of his works yep uh, and a very interesting man too uh, i've known been friends of Peter for about 10 years. Yeah, he's a lovely guy. He's written a book, um, Ancestors Awakening. So that's going to be great. He used to be, he used to be a teacher years and years and years ago, so he'd be good at getting it across. Uh, Kathy Rowan Drewett, um, a friend I've known for many years. Uh, Kevin's ex-wife, actually. Kevin Rowan Drewett is a mutual friend. And she's, she's just... She's just Past her uh, art degree as well, she got first. Excellent. And she's going to do the mysterious Paleolithic figure, the Venus of uh, Hohe Fells. I've never even heard of that, but have you heard of it? The German Venus figure, it's very interesting stuff that. Hmm. And one more is Kathy Monks, Catherine Monks, who comes on, been on quite a few tours. Pathway, Spirits and Stones. So that's, uh, that's the two days. Merely in the Stop. evening, if you want to. Vikings, Atlantis, Sligo, folklore, art, ancient symbolism, you got it all, don't you? Yeah, it's going to be fantastic. If anyone wants any of these sheets, just give me a shout and I'll put some in the post to you. Email me. But like I say, go on, to the, come on the website, book yourself a place, and it's going to be great. I'm really looking forward to the film. It's going to be spectacular. Oh yeah, it will be. I mean, you haven't even seen what I have lined up. You haven't even seen yeah. your. Well, the first was amazing. Start with. And we okay. spent lot, we spent a lot of money on uh, helicopter shots and stuff like that from stock oh. footage places. So that gives it, it it pushes it to the next level, you know. Yeah, we we were, we were lucky enough to go around doing the doing some filming as well, weren't we? And that was uh, that was uh, that was good fun, really. It's an excuse to enjoy yourself, isn't it? So. Yeah, it's also, uh, I never really filmed the megaliths like that before, so it was a good experience for me too as well. Yeah, yeah. A good few weekends away, went up to Orny and down to Glastonbury and Avebury and various places. So it's all been good. Yep. And it all comes together at the conference on the, on the 10th and 11th of September. So, any other uh, else to add? And I'm uh, looking forward to seeing everybody again. Don't forget Chase and Tommy will also be there. They booked their tickets. Oh, of course, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I really do sincerely hope that this opens a whole new dialogue on the Atlantis thing, that uh, everyone can throw their own soup flavour into the soup pot. Yeah, absolutely. I'm hoping this does set a different direction of thought. Because I yeah. think it's needed. And it, the good thing is that to tie the things together, 
that seem to be all involved in this plot, which have never been really included before. Yeah. And how it fits again is fantastic. So yeah, I really hope that it it sends it, it starts a new chain of thought. And also, it, it, people of this part of the world will have a lineage now back to Atlantis. They won't think it's an ancient Greek thing anymore. They'll think, wow, Atlantis is my ancestors. And that's an important yeah. part of why I'm involved. Absolutely, yeah. That, the whole thing brings it all home, doesn't it? Yeah. Fantastic. We don't have to look to the other side of the world. and. Yeah, go west, young man, as they say. That's what they said, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> Right, so hopefully see you all at the Mysterious Earth Conference, 10th and 11th of September. Thanks a lot, uh, Thomas. I'll see you all then. Okay, see you, Neil. See you, everybody else. Right.